Good morning to everybody. Our dream teamers are in the house and, and uh, we are in the sanctuary for the first time, for the first time since March. It's been a long time. But here's what I recognize, that there are more people who are on the other side of that camera than those who are in here. And so we celebrate you. Come on, Dream Teamers, let's give all of our online community a big hand. So glad you're here with us. And as Ryan mentioned, we're going to open up every campus on September the 13th for everyone. And we brought our Dream Teamers in to help us perfect the process. And we're gonna work out the necessary kinks so that when we all assemble on the 13th, that we'll all return in a safe manner. And I wanna welcome you in the online community and we wanna thank you for joining us every Sunday that you've been faithful, that you've been hosting watch parties with your family and your friends and, and your neighbors. And, and I want you to know that even after we reopen our campuses, for those of you who are in a high risk category for COVID and those who are just not ready to return in person, we're going to continue to provide this great online experience just as we have for the last several months. And the truth is, I've come to realize this now, that we're not just four churches, uh, uh, one church in four locations in Carrollton, McKinney, Crossroads, and Colleyville. We are a church in thousands of locations right there in your home. Covenant Church is alive and well and ministering and making a difference, so we want to thank you. Today, we're going to continue our series. It's called The Conversations. And in week one, Pastor Amy encouraged us to pray because of the possibilities in prayer. And then on last week, Pastor Craig reminded us that prayer has to be the foundational pillar of our homes. And as we embark upon part three of the conversation, I want you to understand and I want you to contemplate that God actually extends to us an invitation, and he wants to have the conversation. Now, this is simple. We already know this, but here's what our challenge is. Our challenge is taking the time to accept that invitation, to commune with him, because it's not just about what we share with him, but what he wants to share with us. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come to you today, and we thank you for your grace. Oh, Lord, thank you for your presence. Thank you for the Holy Spirit that is here. Thank you, Lord, that you love us and you care for us. Lord, today we open our heart, we open our mind, our ears to see and hear what you're saying by your spirit. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Lord, for extending your hand to heal. Thank you, Lord, for delivering. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for moving. We give you full permission, Lord, in our homes and in this sanctuary to have your way. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now, as many of you know, I was raised in a fairly large family. I have five brothers and two sisters. And growing up with two older brothers, it, it had its set of challenges, especially since one of my brothers, Rodney, who uh, is only 11 months older than me. And in a family, the pecking order is usually solved when there's a significant age gap. So everybody lines up, but the challenge between me and my brother Bubble, who, whose name is Rodney, the challenge between us was he was only 11 months old, so I wasn't having any of that bossing me around. So I used to tell him all the time, you don't tell me what to do. Now, because of the closeness in our age, and at times, here's the reality, we were very best friends. Then there were other times we were absolutely the worst enemies. And uh, I'm going to share a story with you that is going to shock you, but I'm going to preface it by saying this, that my mom said that of the eight kids, I was the one that gave her the most trouble. <laughs> and she always says this, it's by God's grace that when she sees me and what God has done in me and what he's allowed me to accomplish. She just, she just knows that there is a God. So, so Bubba and I, we, we were having our little disagreement, and, and I don't even remember what it was about, but it was pretty intense. So we started pushing each other, and we started jockeying, and the next thing that I know, we were exchanging these mean looks, and, and we were wrestling with each other, and we were about the same size, and, and he grabbed me by the arms, and he was manhandling me, and some kind of way I broke free, and I got my hands around his neck. 
and words came out of my mouth. This is how mad and how angry I was. I said, I'm going to kill you. I told y'all I was bad. <laughs> so I hear mom running through the house and she gets there just in time as we are struggling and she broke the fight up and she starts crying. I mean, it broke her heart because she heard what I said and he and I were breathing really hard and, and, and she broke up the fight. But here's one of the things that she recognized. She recognized that the house had been in an agitated state the entire day. And so her words to everybody was, let's go to my room. Now, you know what happens when your parents call you to the room, right? Well, when we all got to the room, here's what my mom said. She said, get on your knees now. So now there's been plenty of times when I've gotten on my knees and then I closed my eyes and there was something coming. But in this case, there was no belt coming. There was no apple tree switch coming. She said, it's time to have a prayer meeting. And all of us fell on our knees around that bed and mom began to provide the instructions and the first thing that we all had to do in unison was to recite the Lord's Prayer. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debt as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. One by one, we prayed. And we had to pray in our own words. We had to, to pray at our own pace. And before it was all said and done, I didn't recognize this at the time, but the presence of God had come into the room. We didn't know what to call it back then. We called it goosebumps. But here's what I can tell you that was going on. We all began to weep. You can imagine little kids around the, you know, why is it that parents in the country have these high beds? You know, the kind that when you kneel beside them, you're like looking over them. That's how it was, but around our bed, we were crying and we were weeping and I, I went to my brother Bubba and I apologized and told him how sorry I was and how much I loved him and, and he did the same for me. And see, I remember that the atmosphere that at one time had been charged with tension and strife was now filled with love and peace. I'm thankful that mom knew God and understood that a butt whipping was not what we needed at the time. She recognized that there was something happening in the spirit, in that unseen realm that was influencing the agitation that we felt in our homes. I'm glad that my mom understood and acted on God's invitation to pray. So I want you to know today that we're gonna talk about this, the conversation. The conversation is an invitation to pray. So if you have your Bibles or your electronic device, turn with me to Matthew, the seventh chapter, and we're going to begin reading Matthew 7, and here's the invitation. He says this, ask, and it will be given. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. You see, the conversation involves asking. And we're going to just break this down here in just a few minutes that the conversation involves asking. And here's what Jesus says, ask and it shall be given. And the, the reason why we ask is that we ask for what we wish. We ask for what we wish for at a minimum is that God would meet our basic needs. Now, I want you to know that God understands our basic need. In fact, in a few verses before that, in Matthew, the sixth chapter, here's what he says. He says, therefore, in verse 31, do not worry, saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink or what shall we wear? For after all these things the Gentiles seek, for your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. So he's telling us that, that I've got you covered in the basic things. He goes on to say this, that as we come to him and we ask, here's what he says in Matthew, the 21st chapter, verse 22. He says this, and whatever things you ask in prayer, believing you will receive. I'm reading a book by an intercessor. His name is Reese Howell. And one of the things that Reese Howell said, he, he was a man that was submitted, committed to God. And here's what he says. He says, when I pray, I full well expect to receive what I'm asking for. 
he goes on to say this, that if you're going to pray, you might as well believe that you're going to receive it. Otherwise, there's no need to pray. That's the attitude that we have to take when we enjoin God in the conversation. Why? Because he's the one who says, ask and it shall be given. We believe that we receive what we pray for, not based upon our goodness or that we're worthy, but based upon our heavenly father's goodness and his love for us. So when I think about how our needs are met, I think about the relationship between a shepherd and his sheep. Caleb and I were having this conversation the other day in the, in the car, and I said, Caleb, do you understand that it is the responsibility of the shepherd to provide for the needs of the sheep? Sheep are pretty pitiful animals, and the scripture says that we are like sheep. Why are they pretty pitiful? Because they have no natural defenses. So if they fall over, their, their body, the way it's built, they can't right themselves up. The shepherd has to do that. If they get like a flea or a tick or something behind their ear. They're not like a dog that can just, you know, just scratch away or like us if our back is itching. We can move. A sheep can't do that. If a sheep gets into the water, they can't get out of the water because the weight of the wet wool will eventually drown them. So they are absolutely helpless. So if a sheep is going to be taken care of, it is the full responsibility of the shepherd. So if you happen upon a decimated flock of sheep, It can only mean one of three things. It can only mean this, that the shepherd is not a good shepherd. Or it means that there is no shepherd or that the sheep have gone rogue. You see, Jesus begins to give us an example in John the 10th chapter. If you have your scripture reference there, turn with me. In John the 10th chapter, he begins to compare the good shepherd versus the bad shepherd. And we read in chapter 10 of the book of John, verse 11, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd sacrifices his life for the sheep. A hired hand will run when he sees a wolf coming. He will abandon the sheep because they don't belong to him and he isn't their shepherd. And so the wolf attacks them and scatters the flock. The hired hand runs away because he's working only for money and doesn't really care about the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own sheep and they know me just as my father knows me and I know the father. So I will sacrifice my life for the sheep. What are the qualities of a good shepherd? A good shepherd will lay their life down. A good shepherd will protect and not abandon in perilous times or situations. A good shepherd takes complete ownership of the relationship and the responsibility connected with health. A good shepherd walks among the sheep. I want you to know a good shepherd walks among the sheep. A good shepherd who does not smell like the sheep is not a good shepherd at all. Why does he walk among the sheep? Because he's checking the health. Is there pestilence? Is there an infection set up? A shepherd cannot see that from a distance. They have to be in the presence. Here's what I wanna just challenge every pastor who's watching me. Every individual who has an anointing of a pastor on you. I wanna challenge you and charge you to be a good shepherd. Now, being a pastor doesn't mean you have to be on staff because I'm telling you, this room is filled of hundreds of people who help us pastor this congregation, who are among the sheep, who are among the people, who are doing life with them so that when there's a challenge, there is a phone call, there's a prayer covering, there's a support that comes. We have to be among the people. And I'm just right now just calling uh, for a leadership to arise in this house that I'm calling forth the shepherds, those who have a heart to love and care for people. It is interesting. I was in a conversation the other day and an individual said, Pastor Ricky, you have this unique skill set that you, you know how to fly high, but you also know how to walk among the people. And, and my response was, man, I love flying high. I love strategizing. I love seeing what the future can look like and what God's prepared for us. But I'm going to tell you this. I need to be among the people, not for any insecurity, but because I know this that when we look at the scripture, we recognize that Jesus walked among the people. He walked among the people. 
And here's what I'm going to tell you. Our pastors, our leaders, our dream teamers, our small group leaders, we're going to be walking among the people that we want to be involved in your life if you'll let us. We want to be in your world and in your space, not to get in your business, but to help care, to nurture, and to grow you in the things of God. So here's my question. What condition do you find yourself in? Are you under a bad shepherd? I can't answer that one. But if you're under a bad shepherd, you need to find a new shepherd. What condition are you in? Or do you, do you have no shepherd? And if you have no shepherd, I'm going to tell you, every message you hear me preach, I'm going to be talking about small groups. Because at the end of the day, when I showed up at Covenant Church, my experience became what it was to bring me to this point today because I got involved in a small group. I didn't know the people. We were what we call the international group. There was a guy there had a belt buckle the size of Texas, and I was new to Texas. He had his name on the belt buckle. So I'm trying to figure out, like, you have to look down at your name, the belt buckle, to figure out what your name is. I, I, it was new. There were some, you know, some people from other countries in our group. There were people who were wealthy and people who had no resource. And let me tell you what God did. God knitted our hearts. We began to do life together. I'm going to challenge you that if you don't have a shepherd, then you need to get one. And maybe you might be one of those sheep that's gone rogue, that maybe you were grazing and you just got off the path and now you look up and you're lost. Can I submit to you? that as your shepherd during this season of your life, here's, here's what I want to commit to you. I want to commit to you that I'm going to tell you the truth. You heard me. I'm going to tell you the truth. I'm going to tell it in love. But as a shepherd, I'm not going to in any way, I'm not in any way going to try to hurt you on purpose. Now, there are some things that I'm going to say, and there are some messages that I will preach that are probably going to get right under your skin because I want the very best for you. That's what a good shepherd does. A good shepherd is not going to allow you to wallow in the mud and to live a crazy, disconnected life. A good shepherd is going to challenge you and build you up, but I promise you, I'm going to tell you the truth and I will never intentionally try to harm you with my words of actions. Here's what I promise you. I'm going to pray for you. I'm going to pray that your family is healthy and that you're prosperous and blessed. This week in my prayer time, I was really interceding for those of you who've gotten the notice and you've been furloughed or you've been laid off or you're out of a job. Let me just tell you, God's there for you. He's the good shepherd. And what did he say? Ask and it shall be given. So I'm telling you right now, he extends the invitation for you to ask. Here's what I'm going to do as a, as a shepherd. I'm going to do my best to serve God with a passion so that I can give you an example to follow. It's a tall order, I know, but I have a good example. My father, when we were just before the preteen years, he says to his six sons, he says, here's what I want you to do. I want you to follow me, and whatever you see me do, you can do. It's a tall order, but you know what I believe? I believe that we're surrounded here and this team and when I talk about me shepherding, it's not me by myself. It is the team that is in place. And speaking of shepherd, we want to just continue to bless Pastor Stephen. We want to just continue to just hold him up. Continue to just call his name before the Lord. Continue to let him know how much we love him. How much we're in the fight with him. And with Pastor Mike and Kathy. We love you all. And God bless you. We thank you for all that you've done to get us to this place. So here's what I'm going to ask of you. I'm going to ask that you do this, that if you're not in a small group, connect with one. Every conversation I have with you when I'm praying for you, the first question I'm going to ask is, are you in a small group? Then I'm going to pray for you. Then we're going to give you the link to go connect to a small group. Can everybody say, get in a small group? Get in a small group. Today. And so you have to act. You have to act. Do your part. Here's what I'm going to ask you. Do your part in giving of your time, your talent, and your treasure. 
I've been at Covenant for 32 years, and we've built, multiplied millions of dollars in facilities. And can I tell you that we've never had one individual who had just tons of resource, and they paid for the entire project. Now, if you're that individual out there and you want to pay for this uh, children's wing that we've got going, I, I don't hate you. Come on, bring the resource to the house of God. But here's my point. We have built everything that we've built through these years by everybody just simply doing their part. We built a $3.2 million facility in Colleyville when we came over there back in 2006 and in 2012 we dedicated an 18,000 square foot facility because everybody did their part. This facility that you're sitting in through the years, everybody's done their part. The building that we're building, the East Wing, everybody just do your part. Here's what I'm going to ask you. I'm taking time this morning to pastor. I hope you understand that. But here's my, my final challenge as we, we embark upon this relationship. I want you to choose to grow. I use that word on purpose because the opportunity for growth is all around us. What areas do I want you to grow in? I want you to grow in your relationship with God and each other. You know what I've said to this team? I want us to be the very best and what we do with processes and strategy. But at the end of the day, I don't want you to love process and strategy more than you love God. I want you to love God so much that in your love and your accepting the invitation that you come to him and the processes and the strategy that come out of your relationship with him then begins to support us and takes us all to a new level of where God wants us to go. But I want you to love God with everything, make that the central thing. And then the other thing that I want you to do is I want you to embrace your role in helping us develop a leadership culture. You see, you've got gifts, you've got talent, you have ability, you have skill. Some of you feel like that you're out of the game now. You're never out of the game when it comes to God. You're never lost when it comes to God because the Father is there. So the invitation to the conversation begins with simply asking. And then the conversation begins, the conversation continues to involve seeking. So this is what Jesus says, seeking you will find. And we begin to seek for that which is near, but not readily accessible. And sometimes we seek for understanding as we try to solve a problem or figure something out. We seek that which we have misplaced or lost. I remember the first time I got lost. It was in the Sears and Robux. I was about four years old, and Sears had just come to my hometown of Alexandria, Louisiana, and it was a massive store, and everybody was so elated in that little country town that the Sears had an escalator in it. Well, Mom went to, to the store, and I don't know why, again, she said I was the one who gave her the most trouble as a kid, but I had an attitude in Sears, and uh, while she was uh, shopping, at the end of the, uh, for some reason, I got such an attitude, and, and I was just, here's an old term, humbuggish. I just, I just, I don't know if I wanted to be there. There's too many people. Maybe I had a toy at home that I needed to play. I don't know. But the bottom line is, is when she wasn't looking, I slipped in between the rack where the women's dresses were on. And when she recognized that I wasn't there, she began to cry out, Ricky, Ricky, where are you? And because of my little bad attitude, I was sitting among all of those clothes. I wasn't saying a word. Then I realized she's not calling me anymore. What had happened, my mom had gone all over the store in desperation. She was looking for me. And at the end of the day, when I came out of there and I looked around and mom was nowhere, then I began to panic. <laughs> And I began to cry. Ah! I mean, I let out a wail, and a little lady came over and she said, What's wrong, honey? I said, I lost my mama. <laughs> uh, there's a, a little boy named Ricky who is at uh, checkout station number two. Uh, if that's your son, could you come to checkout station number two? I'm looking. 
Where's my mama? Did she leave me? Did she go? Where's my mama? I'm looking at my mom. I see her in the distance, and I'm telling you, the flood of emotion hits me so hard, I start crying again. Not out of fear this time, but out of sheer joy that my mama has found me. And my mom was in the same place, just sheer joy that she had found me. You see, at the end of the day, I'm going to tell you that no matter where you are, no matter how lost you might be, that God's always looking for you. He tells us to seek and you shall find, but the reality is, the reason why he says that is because he's already found us. See, the reality is this, is that we have not been, uh, we have not chosen God. God has chosen us. Can you look at one of your family members right now and say, you are chosen? Right here, dream teamers, can you look at one another and say, he's chosen you? You see, when we accept the invitation to the conversation, there are some things that we seek for, and we're going to go through this very quickly, but there are three things that we seek for. When we come before God in prayer, the first thing that we're going to seek for is the kingdom. Jesus said that in Matthew 6.33. He says this, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. So why do we seek the kingdom first? Because the kingdom has a system of laws, and because these laws are spiritual, they transcend natural law. And so if you really want your life in order, if you really want to get life and live it on purpose and, and live it by design and not by default, then you need to begin to apply kingdom principles in your daily life. Why? Because those kingdom principles applied gives you access and authority to solve problems and overcome challenges. Think about this. The blind saw, the crippled walked. The deaf hear, the heard, the demons were cast out and the dead were raised back to life. God was glorified when the problems that people faced every single day was resolved. You see, the kingdom is where real eternal life begins and continues for all eternity. So why do we seek righteousness and right standing? We seek right standing because when we get right in our relationship with God, we begin to experience the transformation that leads to right relationship with each other. See, we're in a difficult spot in our nation, and I'm going to say this almost every time you hear me preach, that the, the problem, the solution to the injustice, to the inequalities and the inequities, the hate that's going on, the, the, the solution to that is the church united, the church in love, the church walking in the righteousness that God has called us to. It's our responsibility to protect the unity in the house, because if we stay unified, this nation is going to be transformed. What are we to seek? It's the kingdom. Then we're to seek the lost. Luke 19, 10 says this. Think about this. Luke, the 19th chapter, verse 10 says, For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. Jesus came to take possession of that which was rightfully his. Listen to what the psalmist wrote in Psalm the second chapter, looking into the future, and he says this, I will declare the decree. The Lord has said to me, you are my son today. I have begotten you. Ask of me, and I will give you the nations for your inheritance and the ends of the earth for your possession. Can I submit to you that we as a body, as a community of believers, that we have a responsibility to pray for the lost? And what, who are the lost? The lost are those appointed for destruction. We have a responsibility to reach them, and, and I want you to begin to pray for those people in your circle, the family members who don't know the Lord. Our prayers as we uh, respond to the invitation, our prayers can make a difference. 2 Corinthians, the fifth chapter, verse 19, from the message says this, God put the word square within himself through the Messiah, giving the word world a fresh start by offering forgiveness of sin. God has given us the task of telling everyone what he is doing. We're Christ's representatives. God uses us to persuade men and women to drop their differences and enter into God's work of making things right between them. We're speaking for Christ himself now. Become friends with God. He's already a friend with you. So we seek for the kingdom and its righteousness. We seek for wisdom. We seek for the lost and we seek for the wisdom. James, the first chapter, verse one and two. Let's read that. 
Dear brothers and sisters, when troubles of any kind come your way, consider an opportunity for joy. For you know that when, you, when your faith is tested, your endurance has a chance to grow. So let it grow. For when your endurance is fully developed, you will perfect and complete, needing nothing if you need wisdom. Ask our generous God and he will give it to you. He will not rebuke you for asking for wisdom. So here's what we do, that we ask and it shall be given. Seek and it shall be found. And then the scripture says, knock and the doors will be open. Here's what I'm going to tell you, that when you begin to pray, when you come into this conversation with God, what I want you to do is I want you to be persistent in prayer. I want you to be persistent in what you believe that God has said and what he's declared, and I want you to walk that out. There's a story in Luke, the 18th chapter, that basically says this, that a woman came to the king and says, I need you to relieve me of my adversary. And the king says, woman, get out of here. And then she comes another day and she asks him for the same thing, the same request that relieve me of my adversary. And he says, woman, get out of here. And she keeps coming back every single day because she needs a breakthrough. And the king finally says this, I don't fear God and I don't fear man, but at the end of the day, this woman's wearing me out. This woman is making me tired. This woman is getting on my last nerve. And he grants her her request. Now, let me tell you, this king may have been reluctant, but I want you to know the king that you serve, that king is not reluctant. And then I'm going to conclude here because he says, seek and you will find, knock and the doors will be opened. Or seek and you will find, ask and it shall be given, seek and you will find, knock and the doors will be opened. But here's what I want you to know, that at the end of the day, he gives us assurance that our prayers will be answered. When we look at this particular passage of scripture, just listen to this. He says this, this is the assurance of, he's saying, I want you in my company. And here's what he's saying, keep on asking and you will receive what you ask for. Keep on seeking and you will find. Keep on knocking and the door will be open to you. For everyone who asks, receives and everyone who seeks finds and everyone who knocks the door will be open how much more will your heavenly father give good gifts to those who ask you see the father's heart is this when we understand the father's heart we have to know this is that compared to God all fathers are morally flawed And in spite of these flaws, at the end of the day, they have the ability to give you good things. So now when Jesus says this, how much more will the Father do? He's going the argument from the lesser to the greater. He says, if the earthly Father can do good things, how much more can I do good things for you? I want you to know that God is very, very serious about this conversation about us coming into relationship with one another. He's very serious about us accepting the invitation to speak. And so practically, here's where I want us to conclude. I want to challenge you to accept the invitation. Accept the invitation. And what does that mean? It means this, that you must set aside time to pray every single day. I recognize that for many of you, this is so elementary. But as we come into this football season, I can't help but to think about Vince Lombardi, one of the greatest football coaches there ever was. Here's what he would say when training camp would start with the Green Bay Packers. He would hold up a football and he would say this. He would say, gentlemen, this is a football. Now, these guys have been playing football their whole life. They know what a football is. But what was he saying? He was saying this, that we can't do the great things unless we do the basic things very right. We cannot transform this city unless we are invited to the conversation and accept that invitation. We can't see the lost saved unless we're setting aside that time for God to fill us up, to give us the word. And when you accept that invitation to set aside time to pray, make sure that taking the time, that you make time to listen for his voice. 
write out a pad. We've started praying as a staff on Tuesday mornings and the first Tuesday morning prayer that we had, one gentleman was sitting back and we had our quiet time after we had prayed and I said, now y'all pull out your electronic device, take notes, write down whatever God says. And this one individual said, I raised my head back and I heard rest. And he said, I began to argue with God about, I don't need any rest, I'm just tired. I just need some sleep. And then I got on the microphone and I said, the Lord is saying to somebody, you need to rest. Let me tell you, God's going to speak to you. I believe it because he's so excited. And this is why he says in seven different ways, he gives us the assurance. Ask and it shall be given. Seek and you shall find. Knock and the door will be opened. And everyone who asks receives, and, and he who seeks finds, and the one who knocks the door is open. How much more will the Father give you good things? So I'm going to give you a method that will help you in this time. It's called the SOAP method, S-O-A-P. So when you go into your quiet time, here's what I want you to do. I want you to write out the scripture that you're studying. That's the S, write out the scripture. Then the second thing I want you to do is to observe. What jumps out at you? What words stand out? Put yourself in the conversation that Jesus is having or whatever story it is that you're reading and just kind of just let your imagination just begin to take you and put you right in the middle of the story. And then write out what you observe. And then the A, figure out how you can apply this to your life. Let me tell you, the power of the gospel is in the doing. It is in the application. This is why James says, if you got faith, you need to have some works connected to it. He says, show me a man who has faith, and I'll show you a man with work, and I'll show you a man who's getting some stuff done because faith and works go hand in hand. How do I apply what I read? And then the last thing is to pray. That's the soap method. Pray. God, I just read your word. Here's what I see in the word. How do I apply this to my life? Now, God, help me walk this out. Help me be transformed every single day. And then as an assignment, here's what I want to challenge you to do this week. I want you to commit to pray for someone who does not know the Lord. I want you to pray for them every single day. God, I pray that you bring them into relationship, bring them into community, bring them into, into a relationship with you. God, heal their bodies. Lord, strengthen their minds. I want you to pray for them because here's what I believe, that, that as we pray and we consistently pray, we're going to see transformation happen. Here's a, the next thing I want to ask of you. Download our prayer guide and use it. It's on our website that you can go and you can look it up, the prayer guide. Download it. There's instruction there. There's things to help you pray. And then finally, you knew I was going to say this, connect with a small group. That's your assignment. Get involved in a small group and know this, that God extends the invitation to prayer, so I want you praying today. Let God speak to you this week. Let God show you the wonderful things that he has prepared. And we bless him. Let's pray. Father, we come before you now. And Lord, we humble ourselves. Lord, we receive this invitation to the conversation. And God, our passion is to connect with you. Our passion, Lord, is to hear your voice. Our passion, Lord God, is to see you enter into our world and bring transformation, to bring healing, to bring freedom, to bring victory, to bring revelation, to bring insight to what you're doing and what you're saying. That's our passion, God. Oh, Father, I pray that this week that, Lord, you would whisper in the ears of your people and bring them to you in relationship. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Now, you're watching us in the online community. And here's what I want to encourage you in. Maybe you are one of those individuals who's not under a shepherd, not under the great shepherd. Maybe you've never invited Christ into your heart or into your life, and I'm going to ask you today, I'm going to ask you to make that decision. I'm going to ask you to change the direction and the course to where you're, you're walking and where you're going now, and I'm asking you to come to Christ. Come to Christ. Come to Christ. We've got a button right there on that screen. I want you to just click that button that says, raise your hand because I want to pray for you. Perhaps you've walked away from God. Perhaps you are on a detour right now. God's calling you home. Today, come. Today, come. 
come back to the Father, come back home. Let's pray right now. Come on, dream teamers, just join with me in prayer. And I want you all who are in the online community, click that button, raise your hand right now. And I want you to say this with me. Say, Heavenly Father, I come to you now. I thank you for this day. I thank you that you love me and that you've made a way for me. I'm asking you to forgive me of my sin. I'm asking that you would uh, 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 bring me into a reunion with you, into a relationship with you. I'm asking that you would help me to know you. I accept the invitation for relationship and conversation with you. Jesus, I believe you're the Son of God. I believe you were raised from the dead. I'm prepared to serve you all the days of my life. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Come on, let's give all of those who've made a decision for the Lord a big hand. God bless you. We're so excited for the decision that you've made today. And we're excited for this opportunity that we've had to be with you today. We're looking forward to connecting later. We've got some more things that are coming up right now. God bless you. Have an awesome day.